All right, so thank you. It is my honor and privilege to be here. I'm going to be reviewing. I don't have much that's really new and exciting, but um, I want to frame something, which is what we do here uh, technically is fantastically important, but it lives in a much bigger perspective. Uh, this is the 2002 um, Abrupt Climate Change Report, uh, the 2013 one, the possibility that things happen fast and faster than economic discounting is, is wildly important outside of here because faster and less expected changes really are more damaging to economies and ecosystems. And so in some sense, we're searching for the dragons that are out there. This is the, the globe, the 15, early 1500s globe with the here be dragons. And, and one of our jobs is to, to search for the dragons. Now, you probably know the history. When we discover something, we don't understand it fully. We see a piece of the dragon. And then we do the research and either we find it's really dangerous or we find it isn't. And so there actually is a long history of discovering possible abrupt climate changes that have since proved to be less dangerous than we thought. So yes, there is free methane in seafloor sediment. And yes, methane has changed with abrupt climate changes, but in fact, Giant methane belches are very unlikely because good science shows that there really are safety valves in that system. And yes, the North Atlantic did really interesting things really rapidly in the past, and there's really no question about that. But no, it is pretty unlikely that we're actually going to see anything that competes with that particular movie. So, um, so in point of fact, what we've also learned, and I think this is maybe more important in the biggest picture, is that even gradual climate changes will cause abrupt responses because we have built so many thresholds into the built environment and because ecosystems may have thresholds as well. And so it is just unequivocal that if you have a flood or a rising sea level or a storm, that either the flood water goes over the levee or it goes into the subway or it doesn't. And that particular thing, even a very gradual rise in sea level, if it is not matched by an equally gradual rise in the levee height, eventually leads to something that looks more like this. And probably a lot of the threshold events that we need to worry about in the future are of this kind of gradual climate change pushing built systems across thresholds. Um, there are issues, if you go read this report, fascinating, Jim White chaired the group, it was a very, very strong group, I think. Um, regional droughts, they arrive sharply, they stay, they're hard to get rid of sometimes. Um, there's large uncertainties yet hanging out there about dead zones, uh, oxygen minimum, things of this sort. But in terms of global scale physical systems that could have an abrupt climate change, I. I think it's fair to say that the most interesting one that is still hanging out there is the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. That's not the only one, but I think it's a very interesting one. And if you read this report on the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, um, Pat Pfeffer and company had a very sort of reassuring thing that, that having Greenland fall in the ocean through Jakobshaven was, was taxing physical reality in a way that was um, unlikely. Uh, if Thwaites Glacier were to retreat, it would get to a calving situation which is unlike any on the planet today, and the empirical threshold uh, safeties are not there. And so this particular report says at the bottom, it remains possible that future rates of sea level rise from the West Antarctic Ice Sheet are underestimated, perhaps substantially. Okay, and then you may possibly have seen Ian Jockin's paper. Uh, our simulations provide strong evidence that the process of destabilization is already underway. Um, it is still possible to play with all the knobs in a way that I think leaves it stable. Byron Perizak has done some of that, but um, this is a, a real issue, um, and I think a big one. So the question then, what does paleoclimate tell us about this? And you know the pieces of this, a lot of them will be at today's meeting and the rest of the week. Um, there certainly are suggestions that CO2 levels not much above modern, sustained, gave really high sea level in the, the Pliocene. 
And there's pretty good evidence that uh, in the previous interglacial, sea level got up near modern levels, and then it had another step up. And that other step up was a few meters, and it may have been fast compared to our time scale, although that still is not completely clear. But there's a general picture out there that sort of warmth brought high sea levels. And then there's this one. And Dave Hodel gave a beautiful introduction to this, but what of the Heinrich events? And you know the story. They're defined off of ice rafted debris. Ice rafted debris is a crappy indicator. You can make IRD peaks by rolling over an iceberg. You can make them by changing a drift path. You can make them by making the ocean colder so the bergs survive longer. But if you see a lot of IRD, <clears throat> you know one thing with high confidence, there is no ice shelf. And that's, I think, a really important point, which is that with a very small number of exceptions, like the old Ward Hunt and pieces of the McMurdo, every ice shelf on Earth is melting on the bottom. And yes, some of them refreeze later, but first they melt on the bottom. If you have an ice shelf, you should assume it is melting on the bottom. And so what is an ice shelf? It is nothing more than a debris filter. It is the way that an ice sheet makes sure that it does not produce IRD because it simply holds the debris-laden ice against the ice sheet until the debris is largely or completely melted out, and then it makes icebergs. So the thing to carry away in a cold time is if you see an IRD peak, you do not have ice shelves. And I think that's the, the, the key thing we're going to do with. Now, if you go, this is just above the Ross Ice Shelf. This is a picture of, of Ice Stream B, Willens Ice Stream. Uh, Barclay Cam, Ermann Engelhardt, uh, Slavic Tlachek uh, drilled through all over the place here. Their evidence says that there is debris in the basal ice everywhere in that picture. And the one at the bottom, which is uh, slowed down right down here, Cam Ice Stream, is freezing on pure till just the way Doug McHale said it would. Doug sitting down front over here. And so the debris is there. The debris is not making it to the ocean because the Ross Ice Shelf is in the way and the Ross Ice Shelf is melting on the bottom and losing that debris. Okay? So everything is in place except getting rid of the ice shelf. How do you get rid of an ice shelf? This is a vertical picture looking down on Jakobshaven. Jakobshaven had an ice shelf out here. It went away because the water in front warmed by a degree. And after it went away, it started rolling over dirty bergs. And this is a picture from Ian Jockin. Mark Fonestock and Ian Jockin have made this point very clearly. If Jakobshaven was out at the mouth of the fjord, it would be making a little Heinrich event now. Um, not with the right composition, but nonetheless, it lost its ice shelf. It now makes dirty bergs. Okay? So what do we know about getting rid of ice shelves? Heat. How do you get rid of ice shelves? One of two ways. One is you make it warm on top. The meltwater wedges it open and it falls apart, as in Larson B. The other one, you make it warm at the bottom. It thins, it goes faster, it breaks off as at Jakobshaven. Our understanding is very clear. The way to get rid of ice shelves is to make it hot where they care. And then Heinrich events came out in a cold ocean, as David Dahl showed very clearly. And this goes back to Bond and Wally, right? And this drove me crazy for years. And Peter Clark's down front, and Peter and his group finally figured this out. And, and he had to beat me upside ahead one to admit it, but he got it right, as usual. But um, in point of fact, what do you do if you make the surface ocean cold in the North Atlantic, you make the ocean more Arctic-like with cold on top and warm waters underneath? And so I think they showed pretty clearly from data and from models that a cooling from a DO cycling at the surface leads to subsurface warming. And now you can make a story that makes sense, which is Doug's oscillator is running. The ice sheet wants to surge on a few thousand year cycle. You've got a faster oscillation of some sort from Dansgaard Ushker. It gets cold. It says to the ice stream, hey, do you want to go? It says, I'm not ready. But when it's ready, the cold on the surface warms it at the grounding line. It takes off the ice shelf in a um, Jakobshaven type mode, and you get a Heinrich event. Okay. Now, this may solve another problem, which also goes back to Peter up front here, 
which is, what do we know? There's this big meltwater pulse, 1A, that comes right after the, the bowling onset. Um, it is not just the southern margin of the Laurentide. Peter showed a long time ago. But it's easy to get a lot of water out of the north to contribute to this because there's a lot of ice at low latitudes, and if you warm everything, it can melt. But the fingerprinting shows with considerable confidence that there is a southern contribution to meltwater pulse 1A. And it can't have been huge because there wasn't that much ice in Antarctica, but it surely looks real. And how do you get the southern contribution? Well, it turns out that it's the same time as a, an IRD spike coming north there. Peter's work again. Um, and what we do know with considerable confidence that the main source of melting at the grounding lines of the, the Antarctic are circumpolar deep water. And what is circumpolar deep water? It is slightly modified North Atlantic deep water. And what happens at the start of the bowling? Warm water is sinking to make more North Atlantic deep water. And I think you'll hear some about this this after, oh, in the later morning talk. But it surely is within the realm of plausibility at this point that all of these events really are tied together, that the southern version of the um, uh, IRD peak, the southern version of the Heinrich event, is coming out because of a subsurface warming, which is North Atlantic deep water showing up in circumpolar deep water. Okay? So what do we know? In, in warm places, ice really cares about being melted from above, and it can do this both by direct melting and by meltwater wedging. In cold places, the ice sheets really care about the water at their grounding lines. And so what they really care about is circulation as well as temperature because basically ice shelves love to live in the coldest water on earth and anything that moves it makes it warmer. And so I'll, I'll shut up then and I think that we're getting a, a consilience of paleo data and, and modern data and that Heinrich events really do inform our understanding of abrupt climate change and, and the future of sea level rise which is that when we look at the big ice sheets everything matters we're going to have to do it all right. But if you want the leaning term in the expansion, what do we see? Greenland cares about water temperature, but it probably cares more about air temperature. It's going to melt from above if we make it too hot. Antarctica is really worried now about what circumpolar wa deep water does. And it's not just the change in temperature of that circumpolar deep water, it's where it is. It's what's controlled, whether it sits off the shelf edge or whether it comes up on the shelf edge. And so it may be that circulation in Antarctica and temperature in Greenland are the most important things going forward. And I gotta tell you, I'm hoping that Ian Jockin is wrong and this dragon doesn't beat us, but I'm, I'm not positive, thank you. <laughs>